Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special session on crafting our nation's new collective narrative. In this session, we will hear from five incredible Malaysians of their journey in pursuing their passion and dream, as well as in serving the country to help create a better future for the generations to come. Without further delay, I will introduce the first speaker for this session. She started off her food business project in 2013 as an effort to help her students to continue to receive education in a refugee learning centre where she and her friends volunteered as tutors. Today, this project of hers is a Malaysian social enterprise known as Picha Eats. Picha Eats has partnered with over 30 chefs from Syria, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Palestine, Iraq and Pakistan and has served over 135,000 meals prepared by the refugees themselves to companies, families, and individuals in Malaysia. Here to speak to us about building an enterprise with love, please welcome Picha Eats co-founder, Kim Lim. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Edmund, for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share screen so that everyone can see the slides that I'll be putting up. Hold on. Well, I'm actually sharing all the way from Berlin. So um, it's like 5.45 a.m. right here. Um, but I hope that my energy will still <clears throat> power all of you through. Uh, well, a bit of an introduction of what Picha is. So we're basically a food business rebuilding lives of refugees in Malaysia, uh, basically using food to enable change. Um, a bit of an introduction for myself, like who um, the heck is Kim Lim, right? Uh, because like, uh, although I'm a co-founder of Picha Eats, you know, why I do what I do. Uh, so I like to introduce myself as a full-time social entrepreneur, just because like a lot of people think that being an entrepreneur is already really tough. Being a social entrepreneur is extra tough uh, because of the social side of things that you have to take care of and the responsibility to the society. Um, <clears throat> so I always like to introduce as a full-time just because letting people know that it is possible uh, if you want to try and um, you know make, make a, a career out of it. So I was list listed Forbes 30 under 30 Asia, Prestige 40 under 40 and Generation Tesla Asia um, just last two years as well. Um, now, introducing who Picha is and why we call Picha it. So this is Picha. Uh, he's probably right now eight or nine years old, but when we knew him, he was around three to four years old. And um, he was all the way from Myanmar. And the reason why is in Myanmar, a lot of uh, people are being persecuted uh, and, and by militaries. And what it means is that like, militaries will go into the village, and they will burn down the village and kill people. And people like Picha was actually quite fortunate not to escape that um, disastrous event. But at the same time, they need to flee to another country uh, to save their life. So Picha, among um, many other people and with his family, came all the way down from Myanmar to Malaysia. And he became this number, this statistic, right? 180,000 registered refugees in Malaysia. When I started Picha in 2016, I and mean, we were doing all the sharings, we were probably at 135,000. Um, but right now, our numbers are just increasing just because of the global event that's happening all around the world. Um, but coming to Malaysia, what's the problem is that Malaysia, alongside with a lot of Southeast Asia com uh, uh, countries, do not sign the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. So what does that mean uh, to refugees? It means that refugee adults are not allowed to work in Malaysia. Refugee kids uh, will not be able to gain public education. And healthcare is always very expensive for refugees because they are always charged the foreigner's price. And they couldn't afford it at the first place because they don't have a sustainable living to start off with. So with all these issues, um, it came to us as like, uh, something that we need to work on it. I mean, I just presented you the statistic and the facts, but why, still why do we start what we do, right? So this is myself and my two other co-founders, uh, uh, partners. Um, in the middle is Suzanne and uh, in the white shirt is Suilin. So we started all this as a university student. Um, I was studying music. I was graduating as a music degree holder. 
uh, Suzanne did psychology and Suling did accounts and finance. So the three of us came uh, together during fundraising concerts to help the Refugee Learning Centre that we were volunteering in. Um, and we realised fundraising concerts were not very sustainable. And we thought, hey, uh, then we need to think, you know, what can we do um, to have a sustainable model that helps refugees uh, gain education and at the same time for some refugees to gain a livelihood. So in order for them to gain a livelihood, uh, they have to be able, we have to be able to find a platform or a way for them to um, work, right? So what we did is upon, sorry, uh, upon uh, seeing like how uh, some refugee mothers can actually cook from home uh, and we thought, hey, why not we sell food that is homemade by refugees from wherever they come from with their authentic traditional recipes to Malaysians or people staying in Malaysia. So this is our first encounter with one of the Myanmar lady. In fact, she's actually um, Picha's mom, right? So we call her Ganu. So in the Burma language, in the Qing dialect, Ganu means mother. So from there, we knew that uh, we wanted to build a company that talks about love, shared prosperity, talks about uh, compassion and kindness. And because Picha also embodies that, since he was three to four years old already, we thought, why not we name our company Picha Eats? Um, so you can see uh, right here, Ganu in the middle and uh, Picha with Suzanne right there. We did our first sales to our university, very ugly packaging uh, with the story on top. And uh, it's just a very simple meal, turmeric chicken with corn salad and white rice. That time, I, I still remember uh, the taste of the meal to a kid and so we started doing that selling to our university friends got some response and we continue to see if we can cater to more and more companies so yes you see on the box we're called the Picha project before uh, and we only rebranded to Picha it's in 2019 and on every box you can see that we actually put you know um, uh, a story of the cook that cooks behind the reason why is we don't want to just serve food we want to serve stories. We want to tell people who are the people that are cooking behind. We want to raise awareness about who refugees are and why they are here and why do we need to care, right? So uh, we started uh, distributing these boxes to companies and corporates. And then later on, companies and corporates were asking for buffet services. So we, um, without any prior knowledge on how do we put together a buffet line, uh, me and my partners just try and figure it out on YouTube, on Google, uh, use our profits to buy the equipment. And we just put together a buffet line for our first client that consists of two countries coming together, um, people from Syria and people from Afghanistan. And I think it wowed people at that time because it, it didn't just serve food. It gave them a topic to talk upon. It gave them a feeling. It gave them uh, uh, an idea of not just eating uh, the food to your tummy, but it goes to your hearts before your tummy. So um, that really sparked a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, a lot of passion to a lot of people. Uh, so we thought that hey, you know, there's something going on right here. Should we continue to expand? Um, so we continue to do more and more. Uh, this is all pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic hit. Right, uh, we were doing really well until 2019. And then 2020, the pandemic hit. Uh, we lost all our corporate orders because corporate orders is actually 70% of our main revenue at the, uh, at that time. And we lost all of them in just on March 18 when MCO uh, 1.0 was um, introduced. And we didn't know what to do, but we knew our chefs need to survive. Uh, at that time, we have around uh, 15 to 18 chefs with us. And we thought we, they need to survive. Uh, we need to figure out a way. And so during the pandemic, uh, we kind of changed um, pivot uh, as much as we can. We started like gathering funds to enable refugees to cook. And then we sent to people in need. That way, both of them, uh, both beneficiaries get something to eat. And then we started thinking, you know, how can we do more? How can we be much of a sustainable uh, business? So we started venturing into frozen food items. And you can see in this picture, what we're trying to do is to make frozen food really, really, really exciting. Um, you can see like chapati, you can see Hariyali chicken from Pakistan, the Big Bang Ayam Chili Api, which is our Malaysian favorites. And all of these, we're trying to bring it together 
to serve our uh, customers uh, in, in a way that makes their fridge and freezer really, really exciting. Uh, so we started putting this as a subscription business. Uh, since October 2020 and until today we're still doing it and still hopefully uh, be able to grow it as the pandemic trends change so we're still trying to write on the trend uh, to, to see what serves our customers best and then we started thinking if we if customers couldn't do catering what about catering in a box you know uh, put everything together and we thought oh okay why not we put the mains the uh, uh, appetizers the desserts all together and then we would send to people who are working from home. And that's what uh, the corporate started doing uh, recently, just because we also have like our own delivery fleet. And that meant that we can uh, control our delivery better and also uh, let our customers know that, you know, if you want to uh, send food, appreciation uh, food to your team or your employees, you can work with us as well. Um, and then we also started like making like our group deliveries, our mini buffets, really, really, really exciting. This is last Christmas and on the left and on the right is uh, this year's uh, Raya. And so uh, we really want to bring out the, the, the essence of what refugees can actually produce, you know, what refugees can actually serve and really have them be part of our um, ecosystem, our economy, our society and just prove to people that if you give them an opportunity, they can actually, you know, contribute uh, to our economy or society. So this was actually what, this were actually what we were doing uh, throughout the whole pandemic and we started pivoting and pivoting and pivoting and hopefully you know in the next two to three years as economy reopens we'll be able to have a sorry <coughs> oh, sorry it's a bit cold in Berlin uh, we, 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 we hope to be able to you know create a sustainable uh, business for our B2C model and uh, bring more awareness and impact to the people that we're working with and to the customers that we're serving. Um, a bit of our business model, how we work uh, is that like uh, every food revenue that comes into picture, 50% goes to the chefs, they cover the cost of ingredients and then the rest is their cost of living. The rest of the 50% goes to picture, we cover packaging, logistics, operations and training new chefs. So this year, uh, we've been able to train around uh, 35 chefs and we hope to be able to train uh, with magic support. We want to actually train another 60 chefs in the next uh, one year. Uh, since we started, we've actually worked with more than 500 companies from big uh, MNCs to internet companies to SMEs to government bodies and served around more than 300,000 meals uh, so far. I think the most amazing feature for us as a social enterprise at that, at that point is to be able to garner 4 million ringgit as uh, selling food products <clears throat> in less than three and a half years. And this meant that uh, the business model can work and this meant that we want to be able to scale and help more refugees to uh, integrate uh, into our society if possible. And, but I think the most important uh, numbers are actually these numbers, right? right? Because why we just started, why build an enterprise with love, right? Uh, the most important numbers is being able to impact 180 to 200 individuals on a daily basis. It means that they can pay their rent on time, they can put food on the table, and 100% of them can actually send their kids, finally send their kids to education. Um, and this meant also that uh, we are trying to build something that is possible for many, many people's livelihood and to show the people that, um, um, to show the people that we can actually work around a shared prosperity model. And most of them earn 250% more than a minimum wage in Malaysia because to think as a refugee, to be in Malaysia with no security, with no rights of buying insurance, there are a lot of times they have to save up a lot of money uh, to make sure that they can pay if any accidents or uh, hospitalization happens. So with this one, we really encourage them to earn as much as they can uh, so that we can avoid <clears throat> any fundraising uh, needs to help them overcome their uh, medical issues. So I think... One very, very happy news to share, it just happened like two to three days ago, um, is that you probably will be asking like, so refugees stay in Malaysia forever? Um, no, they're not supposed to stay in Malaysia forever just because uh, Malaysia do not have a, a, a refugee framework for them until today. And it's, it's, it is always best for them to resettle to another country. And this is every time when we receive a 
a share uh, resettlement news is always like the happiest thing uh, we, we, we receive. It's not even the awards, it's not even um, the grants that we receive, it's not even like the profits that we've made. It's when these shares have a better future or will have a better future. So these two shares, uh, Chef Aida and Chef Nisreen, uh, announced that they uh, will be leaving to Amsterdam two months ago. It was a very bittersweet movement uh, moment. Uh, we actually sh- uh, sent them to the airport to fly to Amsterdam. Uh, they've been waiting for six to seven years. And a lot of refugees have actually waited 10 to 15 years. This is, is a, it's a long list, right? And it's, a long, it's long years. Uh, being in Malaysia with no rights at all. So um, it, it, it's a very happy news for them and I'm really, really happy for them. Uh, Chef Nisreen on the right even took her um, a picture eight sticker with her uh, all the way to Amsterdam. So it really makes us proud as uh, these chefs have learned culinary skills, has gained, have gained skills, have learned Malaysian dishes, have learned Western dishes. Uh, and I hope that all these things uh, will help them continue to grow their kitchen and their skills uh, all the way uh, in Amsterdam, right? So I always like to end my presentation with this photo because this photo represents world peace to me. A photo that tells like uh, people coming from different countries, speaking in different languages, you know, from different, uh, practicing different religion and culture, but everyone understood this shared prosperity model and make sure that everyone prosper because they know that if we prosper, they will prosper and everyone uh, will be able to share love and compassion and kindness in this very small little corner of Malaysia. And of course, hopefully we'll be able to magnify uh, this sense of harmony uh, harmony and world peace to the world as what I'm actually doing in Ge- uh, Berlin and German- uh, Germany. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring this to many, many more people. And I hope it inspires all of you today uh, to make a difference because whatever they were doing actually came from little small uh, actions uh, when we were in university. And I'm sure all of you can ask yourself this. So how can you be you and make a difference? You don't have to be Mother Teresa. You don't have to be uh, Gandhi to be making a difference, but because of the little actions that you make on a daily basis, even smiling to someone is going to make a huge difference in someone's lives. Uh, so I hope that this uh, inspire all of you and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'll pass back the floor to uh, Edmund. Thank you, Chef Aida. Thank you, Chef Nisreen. Uh, 